right, guys. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to go through basics today. So we did some katas uh, a few lessons ago. We did some techniques. Um, uh, I think the last lesson we worked on a, a number of techniques. Uh, working through our curriculum, through my dojo's our curriculum of the week. And then we'll finish some of the more advanced curriculum uh, tomorrow, the next class. But tonight I want to go through some basics. Basics are good for everybody, um, even you know, adults that are of rank. It's always nice to go through basics and uh, might pick up a little, a little nuance, a little pearl of wisdom, uh, something that you knew or maybe forgot or maybe didn't know. But it's a nice refresher course for a lot of you. But for a lot of you beginning students, a lot of you kids, uh, these will, I think will be very helpful to give you an idea of not just what the stances look like, but how to measure them yourself. Not having to rely on looking at somebody or something else, but how to measure it yourself so you know uh, not just how to do them, but why you're doing them. I also want to hit on uh, a lot of times uh, when we greet each other as Kempoists, it's, it's always a different way. Sometimes people are confused about when they come onto the mat or the training area, you know, how, to, how to get on the mat, how not. Um, there's, in, in the very first system I was part of back in the early 70s, the Shotokan system, it was very, very strict. The second system I went to was a, a Kung Fu. Uh, mix of different things, mainly Kung Fu. And it was very, very relaxed. When I came to Kempo, it just, I guess coincidentally, uh, as fate would have it, it was an, uh, the perfect mix of not, not too regimented and strict. If you get too, too much on that side, you, you lose a lot of your, your training quality just in your, you're trying to remember all those formalities. And of course, this isn't a you know, 24 hour fitness gym. This, this is a martial arts training center. It's a lot more than that. So. So there is some protocols. When you, what, the way Mr. Parker uh, said it to me, because again, even though I've been in martial arts a long time, when I finally got personally with Ed Parker, I asked him a million questions. And one of them was protocols and, and uh, saluting and all that. He says, it's real simple, Brian. He says, when uh, campus see each other, for instance, when you're coming onto the mat and there's a senior rank there, a human being, that's when you put your left hand over right. That's a salute. And whether you're doing the full salutation or just a quick salute or a salute with the cat stance, whatever you're doing, when your hands go together, that is to a living individual. That's to a human. When you bow, that's just to an inanimate object. That's like coming onto the mat. So if you walk in to the mat, if, if a black belt walks on, there's a bunch of lower ranks, he still comes to the edge of the mat, bows, and walks on. He doesn't have to necessarily salute so there's no one of high rank. He probably will greet those lower ranks with a quick left over right. The lower ranks might hit a full cat stance, up to them. It's really a, uh, to the degree you want to go. It's really who you're, you know, who's coming on the mat. And, and, uh, but usually a couple people just salute each other like that, greet each other that way. You'll see someone in the store, someone at the park, wherever you are, and you'll, you'll get one of those. And, and sometimes I get that a lot. Right away, I don't always recognize the person. They may be from another temple and just know who I am, or they, you know, a lot of times they'll have a hat on or sunglasses, and I'm seeing some person across the way doing this. I know that's one of our people's. That's like our, our little uh, secret greeting, as Ed Park used to say it. So that's what that is. So when you come onto the mat, it's really you're, you're saluting the highest rank and then bow to the mat and move forward. Okay? So maybe that'll clarify things a little bit, make it easier for you. But I want to go through the uh, uh, basics, and there's the way I teach this a lot of times is uh, there's five basics in each category, five beginning basics in each category. And we're going to start with stances. I have, of course, Dasha Smith with me here again today. Um, she's getting ready to test for her black belt, so she's a, a, a good aid to have in these and, and have a good form. Plus, she was part of the uh, BHKK. Dragons demo team for many years. He was the captain of it, so she's got real good form. So follow along with us. So in stances, we start with the attention stance. Feet together all the way, not hanging out in the bus stop stance. Feet together all the way, hands to your side. And here's something that I did not know until I got with Mr. Parker. Knees are slightly bent. Your knees are slightly bent because if you lock your legs, one, a locked leg oftentimes is a vulnerable leg. Also, to move into action, you would have to unlock your legs and then move into action. So always have slightly bent knees, 
bend your legs at the knees. So if we go side view, it's the same thing. My legs are not locked, they're slightly bent. So we can move right into action. So that's what the attention is at. Back straight, knees slightly bent, and hands to your side. Okay? And I always tell them, especially our students, slap on the side. Don't just place it. Slap it, and it wakes you up. You usually do this at the beginning of the class, kind of wakes you up, gets you in the mindset of now you're going to train. Now you're not thinking about school or viruses or anything else. Now you're training right here. Whether you're in this dojo or in your living room and wherever you are in your backyard, slap it up. Now you know you're training. All right, let's move to a horse stance, the, probably the most traditional stance there is going back centuries. So horse stance is feet apart. Feet not out. Feet straight ahead, and that's important. Whenever you're in one of my classes or one of my instructor's classes, we always say, what are the two things you push out? You guys should be answering at home right now. Heels and knees. Push your knees out and your heels out. If you had a horrible stance, it'd be feet out, knees the opposite direction. As soon as you push your heels out, well, that makes it better, but your knees still have to be pushed out. Push the knees out, and now you've got that good horse stance. All right? So hit that horse stance. Now to check the width, people say, well, how far apart should my feet be? How far apart? You can measure that. When you're in a horse stance, you simply pivot on the balls of your feet and kneel down to either to your right or left. Dosh is kneeling down. And Dosh is moving your knee up now. So stay there. And you're in a horse stance, you could, you could choose to have a much wider, wider horse stance if you like to. Dosh likes to have a nice wide horse stance because she's done a lot of demonstrations, a lot of competitions. But technically, if you're teaching, it should be a little bit more narrow because you need to have not just uh, stability, but mobility. And sometimes a really wide, deep horse stance looks real nice, but in terms of mobility, being able to move into action, it's a little harder to move from here. So you can see her knee and her heel are lined up on a straight line. So the back knee and the front heel, and if you connect a line between her back knee and her front heel, that line should point to three, excuse me, to 12 and six. So you're on the 12, six axis. So it goes straight down and lines up and then comes back up. So you pivots on the balls of your feet again. So that gives you the proper width of your stance. The height is whatever's comfortable. Don't be down so low, your heel starts coming off the ground. And don't be up so high, your legs are locked. Anywhere in here is fine. And the hands all the way back to the side. Remember, she's also pushing her knees out real hard. One of the ideas on this, a, a way to, to check it, if you're going to push to the side, I should get a lot of resistance here. I should be able to push in her leg. And if I stomp down, I should be stomping down on the ground. If she had her foot out and I stomp down, I catch her foot. That's what you do not want. So the traditional horse dances, certainly in Mr. Parker's time and long before, one of the drills they would have is to stomp, not on a 90, but on a 45, on their knee and stomp down. So they kick and stomp. They should slide right down the shin. So you're trying to get the shin almost vertical. It's slightly on an angle, but almost vertical in your horse stance. Okay? Now let's go to a neutral bow. Neutral bow should be a straight line from front toe to back heel. So you hear that a lot. Toe heel alignment. Toe heel alignment. Okay, what does that even mean? There should be a straight line from your front toe to your back heel. Anywhere your feet are, you can draw a straight line from front toe to back heel. It has to be in relationship to 12 to 6. Axis point, 12 to 6. You see this line on the different colored mats we have here? Let's switch, Dasha. Switch to the other side. So you can see the straight line from my front toe to my back heel. That gives me the proper width. If I was off that line, I'm too wide. So defensively, I'm too wide open. My targets are too vulnerable. If I'm on the other side, then I'm too narrow. Now, I have good protection, but now I can't access my weapons as well. So my offense is not negated. If you have a straight line front toe to back heel, now you have the best of both worlds, offense and defense. So the line from 12 to 6, from straight line from front toe to back heel, gives you the proper width. Remember we mentioned it a couple of lessons ago. Everything is about height, width, and depth in Kempo. So as you're measuring your stance, this line gives you the proper width. The proper depth is the same way you did the width in a horse stance. Pivot on the balls of your feet and kneel down. When you kneel down, there should be a straight line from your knee to your heel. It's a short line, but if you were to straighten that line all the way out, it'll point to three and nine. 
So when you come back up, hit it on the balls of your feet again, and you're in neutral boat. So from the side view, we're facing this way now, you can see everything's parallel. If my opponent's here, my head is here. My hands are here. Usually you just right off the abdominal region and then up here like an inward block. There's a lot we can talk about later on with hand positioning. Right now, let's focus just on the stances. But my feet, my knees, my hips, my shoulders are all on a 45 degree angle if my opponent's there. Everything's on a 45, my hands and my head are toward the opponent, everything else on a 45. So that's your neutral bow, your neutral bow. All right, let's come back to the forward again. So if we're in a left neutral bow facing you, facing 12 o'clock, when you pivot to a forward bow, remember in a neutral bow, the weight distribution is 50-50. You have even weight distribution. When you pivot to a forward bow, you pivot on the ball of the back foot and literally move your weight forward. Transfer weight forward, boom. Now you're in a forward bow. We're going to do this from the side angle in a second, but you need to see it from the front too, and then back to a neutral bow. You can see my front foot's on a 45. When I go from neutral to a forward bow, my front foot does not move. It's called a forward bow because everything turns forward. It used to be called a bow and arrow stance. Back in the, the old, old days, long before Ed Parker, it was called a bow and arrow stance. So when you lock this thing out, and then you put your punch out, I'll do it from the side and so with the we're here. When you're in a forward bow now, do your punch, but now do the punch box with me. Now put it up on a little higher, like on the same angle as your back leg. And just picture that for a second. So this, her body is like the bow, and her arm and leg are like the arrow. So I call that a bow and arrow stance. So even though the punch is here, they resemble a bow and arrow. So that's why it's called. But a forward bow, back to the forward now, everything is goes from 45, boom, to forward position, except my front foot. And my front knee still stays on the side. Why don't we turn the front foot? If you turn your front foot straight as well, you have no lateral stability. So if anything touches me from the side, anything at all, I'm going to fall that way or that way. Keep this on the side. Ah, uh, you feel it. Play with this. You have no side-to-side -side stability. That's called lateral stability. You don't have none if both your feet are straight. Great front to back, but no side-to-side. -side. Keep that here. Gives you stability, plus this knee protects the groin line. Here, wide open. Here, not. Okay? That's your neutral bow. And one more time, we're in the side view now, in the right neutral bow. When we pivot, remember, 50-50. If I was to turn everything that way into my forward bow, and I change my width and my depth, but not my height, it would look like this. We pivot, but our heel's still off the ground. So she pivots, her heel's still off the ground, but she didn't drop down, neither did I. See, my heel's off the ground. That, that's because we turned in the dimension of width, we went forward in the dimension of depth, but we didn't drop down. Well, as soon as we drop down, it's only a few inches, it makes a huge difference, not just in your power, but it makes sure that heel is on the ground, which makes this leg your bracing angle. So it gives this punch, or whatever else you're gonna be doing, a lot more power. And then back to neutral bow. So neutral bow, 50-50, forward bow is 60-40, okay? So we did a tension stance, horse stance, neutral bow, forward bow, and now, from a left neutral bow, let's do our last of the five basic stances. Obviously, there's a lot more, but let's stick with the first five basic stances. From your neutral bow, take your front foot, and remember, how everything went forward when you went to a forward bow, except the front foot, now it's just the other way around. Everything is going to pivot forward, except the back foot. This back foot's on 45, just like my front foot. When I slide back away from my opponent, boom. My back foot's still on 45, my front foot is still on the straight line. So now the weight distribution is approximately 10%, 90%. You always refer to the front foot first in terms of when you're talking about weight distribution. 10%, 90%. Hands are up in the position. We'll talk about hand positions at another time. But this is the, the, the thing you have to, have to look at. The width of my cat stance. Obviously that's too wide, meaning how far on this side or that side my foot should be. This is uh, odd. This is perfect. There's a straight line from my front foot to my back heel. That gives you the proper uh, width. So when you're going this way, too wide, too narrow, perfect, straight line, okay? We're gonna go to the side view now. So in my cat stance, I'm in the right cat stance, facing this direction. 
When I'm in this position, we already talked about what gives you the best width, straight line, front toe to back heel. But now, what gives you the depth of the cast dance? Am I way out here? Am I way up here? I see this a lot. It's not a cast dance. It's not a good one. So, to get the depth of the cast dance, see my, I just put my heels together. I raise my uh, right foot up, my lead foot up on the ball, and see where my big toe is, I put my heel right there, and I raise up again. And that gives you the proper depth of a cast sense. Meaning, how far should this foot be from this foot? Well, two of your own foot lengths. Two of your own foot lengths. If you've got a crazy long foot, you're going to have a really big, if you have a regular size foot, so whatever size foot you have, whatever length of foot, two of those lengths from your back heel, and that gives it. The height, once again, at a height that feels comfortable to you. So height, width, depth of your cat stance. And back to natural stance. So those are your basic stances. And again, work those, work those, work those. Get comfortable. Those five. Right? Don't worry so much about the other ones. Those five will get you through most of your first uh, couple belts of techniques anyway, for the most part. Okay? So the next set uh, of basics are your five basic foot maneuvers. Five basic foot maneuvers because stances are your foundation. Stances are the foundation. You have the foundation of your house. Is it on sand or is it on cement? What is it on? Your foundation of all the things you're going to be doing in Kempo is a lot of it is based on how good your stances are. All right, so we worked on that. Now, how do we give those stances mobility? How do we move around from one stance to the next? I'm here, I want to be over there. How do I get there? Well, I have to get there with a foot maneuver. Right? When you walk down the street, your foot maneuver is just a step through. You're just walking down the street. But it's a foot maneuver. It gives you mobility. Right? It gives you locomotion from point A to point B. So we'll start from our uh, neutral bow. On the first one, though, because everyone learns this on their first foot maneuver, it's usually a switch. So there's, there's different kinds of switches. Again, another time, another, another class. But we'll start for today. Just do a hop switch. So Dasha does a hop switch. So that's all it is. She's in a right neutral bow, she hops to a left neutral bow. Mm -hmm. Now she's in a left neutral bow, she hops to a right neutral bow. So it's just a hop switch, she's hopping in place. Okay? So she's in a neutral bow. The next one we're going to do is a cover. And we're going to do that from both, both angles because you need to see. But this is really important. Uh, I mean, many, many years ago in the uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s, I had just started with Ed Parker must have been 1980. And a friend of mine was uh, down at the Chuck Norris School. So his name was Big Jimmy Diggs. Jimmy Diggs was training with Chuck Norris. I was training with uh, at the Ed Parker School. And uh, this came up. Chuck Norris' school, loved Mr. Norris, had a great system. But at the time, the way they were teaching to attack something from behind you just wasn't logical. And I didn't know a whole lot about Ed Parker's Kempo at the time, but I knew how to cover. And covering properly changed my friend Big Jimmy's mind, and he left the Chuck Norris School and started Kempo like a month later. <laughs> it was based off of how to cover properly. So if you're in this position and you have danger behind you, 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 you might feel something, you might hear something, one of your five basic senses is going to alert you there's danger behind you. So you have to confront it, you have to confront it in a way that's logical and hopefully keeps you as best we can out of harm's way. Again, always think about the best of both worlds, offense and defense. So I could keep my feet in place and simply turn. That's not safe because you have not moved the target. You're the target, they have a weapon. You want to move target and weapon. So if I take my back foot and step one of my own foot lengths and Dasha with her back foot steps the same incorrect way and turns, it's no good, because you're still on their line of action. I'll show you with her in a second. But if you take your front foot and step your own foot length again to step off and turn, you're off of their line of attack, and that's what you want. So if Dasha's facing this way, actually, Dasha's facing that way. Uh, so if I'm right behind her, again, it could just be a finger in her back, but I could be back here. It could be a weapon in her back. It doesn't matter. I'm confronting her. I'm going to back up to this so you can see it. I'm directly on her center line. If she simply keeps her feet where they are and just turns, that's no good. Whether she's trying to take the weapon or not, it doesn't matter. She's still in line of, let's say, someone pulling the trigger. No good. So she goes back. 
If she takes her back foot and moves just one foot length over and turns, no good. She's still in the line and back. But if she takes her front foot and steps off, now she's completely, at least this far, off the line of attack by moving her front foot. And that's what's important. So I'm facing you now. She's going she's gonna to point to the middle of my back. And this is an important concept that a lot of people don't get. They think they're covering with the front foot just because we say so. There's a reason for it. So now, stay there. So she's still pointing to the center of my back. And you're not going to see her gun sight for a little bit because I'm still in it. So if I simply just turn, you know it's not good because you still can't see her gun or her weapon. Because I haven't moved my body. I haven't changed my height or the depth. If I take my back foot and step and turn, still no good. You still can't see her gun because I haven't moved away from it yet. So if you take the front foot though and step and turn, now you can see her gun, can't you? That means I got off her line of attack. That's how you cover properly. Okay? So, we did switch, we did cover. Now, we have toe hill alignment and the right reach well. Now just do a step through. And when you do a step through, sometimes it's called a C step. Step straight through so your feet pass right next to one another and then land. Step straight through and then land. Now let's do it in reverse. Straight through, boom. And straight through. So your feet should be passing next to each other every time. The next one is easy. Everyone knows this one. Almost anyone watches knows this. It's a drag step. Why is it called that? Because you drag and then you step. So the back foot drags up to the front foot and we simply step. We drag and we step. Do it in reverse. We drag then we step. We drag then we step. Facing this direction, we're doing a drag step. We drag up and then we step. Now going in the opposite direction, we drag, and then we step. So it's called a drag step. Face it straight ahead again. Now we'll do a step drag. So the front foot is going to step approximately the length of your own foot again. So you're going to step the front foot, and however far you step, however far you chose to step, you must drag equal distance with your back foot. Drag up. So your foot maneuvers are never hurting your actual stance. If you have a perfect stance, then you engage in a foot maneuver to get to another position, you still should have a perfect stance. Don't let your foot maneuver wreck your stance. So now we're doing it again. Step and drag. And in reverse, step drag. Now we're going to face this direction. Watch the feet. We first step, and then again, drag, equidistance. Drag. Step drag. And then in reverse, we step the back foot first, and then drag, and step drag. Those are your basic foot maneuvers. So we're going to move on now to blocks. So with blocks, there are five basic blocks. Again, everything we've done so far are in groups of five. That's why it's easy to remember. Groups of five, groups of five, groups of five. So we have five different groups of basics, and each one has five in the individual group. Easier to remember, easier to train. So with our blocks, we're in a horse stance. We start with an upper block. We come straight at the center of our body, and when, it get, when our knuckles get to the height of our eyes, we turn it over. Our arm is on a 45 degree angle. Our fist is directly across our opposite ear. This would be incorrect. This would be ridiculous. Here, straight up on a 45, and back down the same way it came up. One more time with the right hand though. You want to envision striking someone, a bad guy, to the jaw with your fist. And now continue raising your arm up, but turning it on a diagonal and hitting them in the same target, their chin, hitting them again, but this time with your forearm. Boom, your forearm hits them. So as you come up, it's one, two, and then back down. All right? So from the side, we come straight up like an uppercut, in a vertical position, and we turn. So you can see the depth of my block is on a 45 degree angle from my head. It is not straight above my head. It is not straight out. It is on a 45 degree angle. So much of what we work in Kempo on 45 degree angles. And then we come straight back down. One more time with the same hand. Straight up, turn, straight back down. Back to the horse stance facing 12. Inward blocks. Today, focus on doing a hammering inward block. Bring your hand up, palm facing out, strike across. Bring your left hand up. Palm facing out, strike across. Right hand comes up, as high as your eyes, and pretend like you're in a hallway, the 
It's only as wide as your shoulders. So if you bring your hand up, bring it straight up. Don't bring it up here somewhere. Bring it straight up, economy of motion. Strike across on a 45 degree angle again. And up and in. That's a hammering inward block. But for the most part, is what the main block, you're, the main inward block you're going to be performing between white and green pretty much is a hammering inward block. So you use that one. Outward block. There are two kinds of outward blocks when you first begin. The extended outward block is the one you'll have in the star block. So the extended outward block, we first come across to our opposite hand, to our right, to our right sitting on top of our left. And now come in front of your face like a windshield wiper. Again, knuckles high as your eyes. When it hits the perimeter of our body, strike out on a 45 degree angle that way. All right? Usually I say, pretend like you have a knife in your hand and you're stabbing away. I said, Mr. Parker used to teach it. Or think of uh, a nice fuzzy stuffed animal, but hit this way. Turn this way, so your palm isn't facing here, your palm isn't facing there. It is the trajectory, is the 45 degree angle, but the position of my weapon is here. Very important. This way. And come back down. Same hand. We're going to take our right hand over to our left hand, come across, and then turn on a 45 degree angle. Our left hand comes across, lock, turn, on a 45 degree angle. These are primarily geared for circular punches. Circular, not linear, but circular. On the side view, we come across, right hand comes to left hand, we come in front and strike. See how it goes away from our body. Left hand comes across, in front and away from our body. Right hand comes across and over, and uh -huh, all the way, and left hand comes across and over. Okay? So we did upward, inward, outward, now let's do downward. I want you to chamber it. Again, when you first learned it, it's just like you did the extended outward blocks. We're still in a nice low horse stance. Heels out, knees out, back straight, butt in, hands to your side. So now downward blocks. Take your right hand, come across to your opposite side, and strike down. Come across your opposite side with your left hand now, and strike down. Right hand come across, strike. Left hand come across, strike. I'm saying strike because blocks are strikes. They are more offensive than they are defensive. They initially begin defensively, but you want them to be offensive. You want them to strike and hurt whatever part of their body was trying to hurt you or someone you love. Strike it. Okay? From the side view, we come across with our right hand, and we strike. Now you see, I'm not down here right in front of the groin, out on a 45 degree angle again. We're not straight on 90 up here. We're not straight on 90 down here. We're right in the middle on the 45. Uh, again, left hand comes across, and strike down. Right hand comes across, and strike down. Left hand comes across, and strike down. Back to position. The last of the five basic out, uh, blocks is your second kind of outward block. This is the one you have in uh, short form one. So the extended outward block you have in the star block, you'll recognize it from there. And then the vertical outward block you'll find in short form one. So we're in this position, we're bringing our right hand over, and strike, and it stays right there. So from your perspective and from mine, my arm is in a vertical position, straight up and down. Vertical, as all you guys know, especially you kids, we talk about this a lot. Vertical means straight up and down. Left hand comes across, strike. Right hand comes across, strike. Left hand comes across, strike. Side view, and this is important too because watch, my right hand comes across and I strike. From my perspective, my point of view, my arm is vertical. But from your point of view, my arm is on a 45 degree angle. So I'm not here, I'm out here. Okay, so vertical outer block again is on the 45. Left hand comes across, strike. Again, vertical from where I'm looking, but from your perspective, you see that's on a 45 degree angle. So we don't wait for a punch to get this close to try to block it. We want to catch it out here. To beat the action, you've got to meet the action. So go out there and meet that punch. Don't wait for it to get all the way to you. Come across your right, vertical outward. Come across your left, vertical outward. Okay? So that's your five basic uh, blocks. Work on those. You'll find them. You'll, you'll put them into play in all these other techniques. A lot of the things that we did, all the techniques we did yesterday, or the last lesson, we'll employ almost all those techniques, all those blocks within the techniques. And now strikes. Again, there's a... One of the, the great things about Kempo, like I told you, one of the things I found that I just loved about Kempo, it was so comprehensive. 
So, you know, my boxing, my wrestling, my Shotokan, my Kung Fu, opened my eyes to all kinds of ways we can make weapons with our bodies and how we uh, visualize targets and how we acquire targets and, and this kind of thing. Um, but the versatility of our strikes are just uh, off the charts. And, and that's one of the things that really pulled me into Kempo and, and that made me stay it. So for this position, we start with just a regular horizontal punch, point A to point B. Point B, we're going to say the target is the solar plexus of the person and roughly our own size. So we come straight in, rotate as we strike. In uh, boxing, I was taught rotate just before you strike. And Parker said, nope, rotate as you strike. All the way out and just uh, be begin penetrating. Generally, you went on this far, meaning, stay there enough. Meaning, if I'm trying to punch her in the shoulder, I would wait, I'm all the way here, see my fingers, I'm finger length away. That's when you start the rotation. So as you're rotating, you're driving through the target. You don't come here and rotate now, then hit. Why? Because the rotation itself gives you power, it gives you torque, all rotational force, rotational torque. And you want to have that rotational torque happening as you go through the target, not just before you hit the target, as you hit, it starts just before you hit, and then rotates through the target, much stronger that way. So, we come straight out, palm up, boom. Make sure, make sure the wrist is straight, we'll do that from the side angle in a second. But now as this one comes back in chambers, this one comes out, boom. So, point A, my hip, to point B, the target. Don't go anywhere else, it's a linear punch. As this one pulls back, this one goes out. Now, as we do it from the side view, You'll see there's actually a double strike. So simultaneous strike. So really for your very first Kempo lesson, like my first Kempo, probably my second lesson I think, they were showing me when you punch forward, strike someone behind you as well. So that this isn't just a chambered position like we keep it here because it's tradition. No. This is an elbow strike behind you. Some systems will have their hands chambered here. Well, there's no function there. This doesn't serve any function, this elbow now, so it's hanging out. Or they'll have it way up here, which is awkward. Have it right here, right here at your side, as if you're striking someone behind you. That's why you have it all the way to your hip, so I can have depth of penetration on the person behind you. So Dosh and I are here, and I'm punching with the right hand, just punch, regulars. But now, my, the second series, as I pull my right hand back, it elbow strikes the person behind me, and the punch goes to the person in front of me. And these two separate actions help each other, give each other extra power. So again, we switch, and we switch. We try to get it to where the punch and the elbow are simultaneous. Simultaneous, boom, and bring it back. Okay, from your horse stance, again, let's go to a heel palm. So similar to the punch, we'll take the heel palm up higher right now, but similar in that you rotate at the end. So I'm going up to hit someone in the jaw, we'll say the target is the jaw. We'll go up like a punch to the jaw, but then turn it the last minute. When you make your heel pump, see my fingers are, these three fingers are lined up. Normally, that middle finger is taller, right? It's longer. But we want to have a unified front. So we bend that a little bit. In fact, we bend all those fingers, these three biggest fingers, these three, we bend them slightly to give them more, more force, more power, more rigidity more stability. So that's, that's a little bit of back of mass there. Mainly it's just a proper form. So these three fingers are getting together, okay? My hand doesn't bend here at these knuckles. I see a lot of people doing this. See these knuckles? It doesn't bend there. Those knuckles stay pretty much straight. These knuckles across the back, at the bottom, at the base of my fingers. It's these knuckles, ones above the bent side. So this is the universal position. We do a heel palm with this, we're going to do a hand sword with this, inward and outward. We do four finger strikes. We do rich hands with this, right? Inverted this, inverted that. Same configuration though. The weapon, form of the weapon, that's not changed. So from this position, we're going to come straight in with a nice low horse, knees out, heels out. Straight in, boom. Heel palm to the jaw. And left, boom. And right, boom. And left, boom. And from the side now, again. Coming in, heel palm, and heel palm, and heel palm. Check the formation of your weapon. So it's not just how you delivered it, how you got the weapon out there. Make sure the weapon itself is formed properly, and strike.
Okay. Next one is back one. You'll have this in checking the storm and various other techniques, alternating maces on the first belt. So from here, there's a number of ways you can do this from a horse stance. Because normally you're already in the middle of a sequence, you can do a back knuckle. But as you train with this, just bring your hand straight over to your opposite shoulder, much like you were going to do your extended outward block. But from here, bring it out and whip a back knuckle to any target you want. But we're going to envision right up here to the temple or the hinge of the jaw. The back knuckle, when we punch, we hit with this surface of the fist, this front surface. A back knuckle, though, hits with the back of these two knuckles. Sometimes this is called a back fist because your whole back, your, your fist is hitting the opponent, but you're focusing right here on those two biggest knuckles, back knuckle. And it's not a linear action now, it's called what we call a path of action because the whole arm is moving out, the whole arm is moving in a path, all right? It's not just a straight line from that position, from the position, the viewpoint of the opponent. So come across and strike out and come back, come across strike out and you want to whip it. You want to have the return motion faster than the, the weapon went out. So however fast you went out to hit the person, try to snap it back even faster. So that creates not just a snap, but in this case, a whip. So come across and snap. And come across, snap. Come across, snap. All right? Back fist or back knuckle, we do that from the side. We come across, snap. Come across, snap. Come across, snap. So if you're in a neutral bow, the fastest weapon you have from point A to point B is the front hand. Front hand back fist. It's just straight up. It's not coming from the rear hand. It doesn't have to change. But sometimes if you have a position over here slightly, a jab is just as fast. But the back fist is usually a little sneakier. And it sometimes will get over a block and still hit the target because you have the weapon is really all the way from here to here is your weapon. You're, this is the end result, the knuckle, but straight out and back. So it's the fastest weapon you have, point A to point B. So back fist, back knuckle is very important. Hand throws. So now, we said the universal configuration, the formation of the weapon is this. So now, take this across and do outward hand throw. Left hand comes across, outward hand throw. Right hand comes across again. Outward hand sword. Now, when you're doing the hand sword, you'll notice once again, my arm is on a 45 degree angle. This is for a number of reasons, both offensively and defensively, why we do this. But keep this one with you today. The elbow is always lower than the wrist. So when you're striking, it's a little more powerful. If I strike that way with this hand sword, but drop my weight at the same time, have my elbow lower than the weapon, will enhance the power of that hand sword. If my elbow is as high as my weapon, my elbow is high as my weapon, and I'm striking, it's all shoulder strength. And just the mass of your arm moving through time and space, being uh, thrown out, generating the power. The power is coming from your shoulder, and it's just all firing from there if you're isolating it. But if you're here, and you strike, and drop that weight a little bit, forgetting about the width and depth and everything else, just the height, you'll get a lot more power if your elbow's lower than your wrist. And the easiest way to get power, to generate power with our body, in terms of the dimension of height, width, and depth, all right, in our body, is just height, just dropping your weight, right, hitting anything. If you stand here and hit something, you have a certain amount of power. If you drop your weight, a ton more power, because all your weight's dropping with that strike, not just an isolated strike. So the outward hand sword, once more, we come across the right hand, strike out, elbow lower than our wrist, Come across and strike out. Inward hand swords. Bring it up, much like you did with the inward hammering block. Bring it up, like you're saying hello, but you're not. Strike into the side of the neck. Elbow lower than the wrist. Left hand comes up, strike. Right hand comes up, strike. Left hand comes up, strike. Inward hand swords. So you have an outward hand sword have inward hand sword. Sometimes practice inward to outward. Inward to outward. Okay? And uh, the last set are elbows. Lots of elbows in Kempo. But the first two you start with, inward horizontal elbows, upward vertical elbows. So inward horizontal elbows, when you come and throw that elbow, you throw that elbow, you have to understand you're coming here with your hand. 
it has to touch your chest first. It's not out here. If you hit somebody with an elbow this way, all of this is just your shock absorber for them. It helps them. You want something solid. So when I hit somebody with this weapon, yes, we're trying to hit with this portion of the weapon, the end, but any of this may be striking from my wrist all the way to my elbow. And you want all of this to be strong and sturdy and stable and solid. It's out here again, and I hit something, it's going to just very shit, not near as strong. So when you're doing these, make sure hand comes up and then rotate in. So you're coming, boom, this way. Horizontal, because we move across horizontally. So but keep that up there. So it's one and two. And have your elbow, don't just point towards the opponent. Have it go through the opponent. And three and four. So brace. And don't have your elbow turn, your wrist rather. Don't have it turn like this. You get pressure this way, and it compresses that, and you break your wrist, or at least sprain it. Very painful. So don't have it bent like this. Have it straight, just like you would in a punch. When you're punching, when you're punching, everything is straight. When you lay a book or an iPad or something on your hand, it's not up, it's not down, it's straight. When I'm here, it's the same thing, same thing. And then the last one for this series is the upward vertical elbow. So all of these are when the opponent isn't at mid-range or medium range, somewhere out here where I can reach them with a medium range weapon, but they're closer. So I'd have to hit them with an elbow coming this way or maybe an elbow coming this way. That's your upper vertical elbow. So visualize a bad guy here in front of you. Come up, you may hit it with your fist, but right now just visualize hitting with your elbow. Bring that right up near my shoulder, just compress it, and then as I raise my elbow up, rotate the hips, boom. So it doesn't just stay still and hit, you can, but you're gonna hit just as you get past your solar plexus height with that elbow strike, turn. Turn gives you a little extra power, boom. Also, flexibility and reach. For you kids, it's, it's a lot easier to get your elbow up high. When you get older, it's, it's harder. It's not just like old folks. When you mature, your muscles get a little larger, get a little tighter, a little denser. And it's harder sometimes to get your elbow up. You're trying to get it to the height of your head, boom, all the way up. So practice this to get it up as high as the top of your head. So from here, we come, like you said, we come up like a punch, but then we turn it sideways. See my fist goes sideways, like you're talking on a phone? You come, boom, all the way up, straight up, boom, all the way up, up, up. So from the side view, same thing. We're coming up. See that turn slightly into the horse stance, and up. And up, and see, remember, my palm is facing my ear, like I'm talking on the phone. And up, palm is facing my ear, and then back side. All right, so now, the last group, we've done five groups of basics. Now we're on the fifth, which is kicks, all right? So, uh, Dosh is gonna be in a left neutral bow. When we do, when we teach children how to kick, uh, this particular kick, a ball kick with the rear foot, not a step through ball kick, per se, but a ball kick with the rear foot. I get a front foot, I have a rear foot. I would teach them, open the front door, so my front foot is straight, and everything is straight. And then, kick, and then come back and close the door. But, for teenagers and adults, you actually do it all together. It's like when you punch, you rotate as you punch, you rotate. You don't rotate your fist, and then punch, because all that rotation, the power generated there is wasted. You don't rotate and then punch. Same thing here. Once you rotate, you lose a little bit of your power in the kick and then come into kick. But with the kids, sometimes it's hard to rotate at the same time. So what you're trying to get to is when this knee passes this knee, imagine a little wood peg coming out the inside of this knee. As this knee hits that peg, it hits the peg and turns my front foot straight. Boom. Now it's straight. So as you bring that knee up, it turns. That's when you pivot that foot. When do you pivot the front foot? When the back knee passes the front knee. So Dasha, do it the way we do it for most of the kids, especially if people are just learning. She opens the front door all the way first, then she raises her knee up, then she kicks, and goes back and closes the door, okay? Also, when you're kicking, the weapon is formed thusly. So I'm not here, my foot is not flexed, my foot is up here. So the position you're kicking, formation of the weapon is there. It's the ball of the foot. My toes are not pointed. My foot is pointed, not my toes. So Dasha's going to do 
the original way, she opened the front door, she raised her knee up, and then when she kicked, snap it out, and yeah. So from here, her foot is pointed, her toes are not pointed. And then she comes back, and now she now face that way, and the left foot should blow. So, same thing, she opens the front door, she raised her knee up, and she puts her foot out. From here, you can see her foot is pointed, her toes are curled back. Point your toes, Dosh. That would be foot and toes pointed, but they're not. It's the foot pointed, toes curled back, toes are flexed, and then she retracts. So the weapon being the ball of the foot. So now, facing the 12 o'clock again, switch. So now she's going to do a ball kick again, but not with the rear foot. She's going to do a ball kick with the front foot. And this particular one, there's lots of, lots of different ball kicks you can do, even with the front foot. This particular one is called in-place ball kick. So she's going to slide her front foot away from the opponent and into a cast stance, which we covered earlier. From that position, right there, her front foot, her hips, and her shoulders are all pointing towards the opponent to maximize her power. Then she raises it up and kicks, and then right back to a neutral bow. That's called an in-place ball kick, kicking with the front foot, but technically in-place ball kick, if the opponent's in front of you. So now she's in the right neutral bow, facing to the side. Same thing, now I want you to envision, back up just a little bit. So if I'm back here, she could easily open the door and take that back foot and reach me. Boom, so she could reach me with the back foot, I'm at distance. But if I'm really close, she can't do that. In this case, she would pull away from the opponent, and you see that, that buys her that room. Then she could raise her kick up, and then come back in. We're still here, but she put the kick in. She got that just Here she can't really throw it, a ball kick. But if she pulls away, she can't. Kick. Okay. And ball kick. Then cast it. And kick. Okay, so facing 12 o'clock again. So she's still in the right neutral bow. She did a ball kick with the rear foot, and she did a ball kick with the front foot. Now she's going to do a drag up side kick. So the foot maneuver drag up, we have not done yet in kicks. We did it in foot maneuvers, but now we're going to put a drag up maneuver with the kick. So the opponent's in front, she wants to kick with the front foot, but he's still at distance. So she drags towards the opponent, and at this point, this is important, you turn your feet, hips and shoulders completely sideways, 90 degrees from the opponent. Later on, you can modify this, some people go into 45 and this and that and whatnot. Get in a side, side position, so you're, you're, the larger muscle groups, especially your glutes, are going to be engaged in this kick. The weapon on this kick is the bottom of the heel. So it's the bottom of the foot, but we know there's more than just one surface of the bottom of your foot. The ball kick was the bottom of the foot, and just uh, emphasizing the ball. Now it's the bottom of the foot, but then emphasizing the heel. So she raised her knee up, and this time her toes and her whole foot is flexed. That means curled way back. And she reaches out and strikes. So on this position, you'll see everything's curled back, everything's flexed, and this bottom of the heel is what the striking surface is. Not so much the ball. Then she retracts it and comes back to position. So again, she drags out the turn sideways. She never takes her eyes off the opponent, but her feet, hips, and shoulders are all facing on a 90 away from the opponent. Now she raises her knee up, leans over and kicks. Boom, and comes back to position. And back. Now just do it a little quicker. Now she kicks without locking it, but boom, that's the drag up side. Okay? And then she switches. All right, two more kicks of your basic kicks. Now we're gonna do a step through roundhouse kick. So Dosh, just do a step through roundhouse. Okay, and then back to position. So the weapon now is the top of her foot. Her foot's going to be pointed. Her foot and toes are going to be pointed, striking with the top portion of her foot. So, but when she first starts coming around, I, I want you to see how she emphasizes getting the knee up high. So she's only going to spin about halfway. She starts raising her leg up and starts to turn. Yeah, see how high the knee came up right away? Like you're laying your leg on top of a table. Her foot's horizontal. Her whole shin is. It could be Diagonal, that's, there's no problem with that. When you first learned it, try to get it completely horizontal. Foot is pointed, striking surface is on the top. So she kicks, and then lands, and then goes back to position. Okay? But again, you'll see her knee doesn't come in straight. It starts coming around right away. Like if there's an opponent here, she's hitting that person with the roundhouse knee. So she spins in position, and she snaps it, and then lands in front. Returns to position. All right, now she faces a left neutral bow. 
So same thing. She spins into position, kicks it, lands, and returns. She jumps up and switches. So watch her leg. She spins, the legs up nice and high, her toes are pointed, she kicks, and lands, and returns back to position. Okay? And then switch stops. So now she's gonna move forward a little bit. So now our last kick, a little more. Our last kick is called the in-place back kick. So a back kick in general is not just you're kicking behind you. You can do a, a back kick anywhere. But it's the formation, it's the position of your hips in relation to the opponent and the position of your foot. So in this position, we're going to assume the assailant's close. She's going to drag her front foot away from the opponent and turn her hips completely away from me. So she drags away from me. So everything just turned away, okay? She was in a neutral bow, her hips are here. When she did her drag up just now, she turned and everything's here. But she's always trying to keep, one of the general rules of Kempo, try to keep both your hands at all times between you and the opponent. So from here on behind her, she, as best she can, she has this one between us and she has this one between us. She can't turn all the way around, so this is the best she can do in this position in relation to the opponent. And from there, she's going to reach out and, and, and leave it in there. Yeah, here. And this is important. We'll do it when we change directions. But her foot's in a vertical position right now. A vertical position. It's not sideways. It's not diagonal. Vertical. That lines up her hips properly for more power. She retracts it and then comes down and back to where she came from. So again, imagine the pulse right behind her. She drags away, looks over her shoulder, snaps it out, boom, comes right back to position. So now, facing uh, 12 o'clock, so same thing. She drags away and kicks and back to position, switch. She drags away from the opponent who's behind her, kicks, lands, and then back to position. Okay? So you guys, I want you to work on those things. Remember, we talked about salutation and saluting. We did salutation a couple days ago, the whole salutation, at least the, the, the framework of it. There's a lot more to talk about, about the salutation. But saluting and bowing, all right? Remember, anytime you go left over right, no matter what your feet are doing, anytime you go left over right, that's directed towards an individual. And not just a higher rank, any, any Kempoist, all right? Generally, though, a higher rank, a general higher rank should go to a full cat and whatnot. But this connotes an individual. Bowing is to inanimate objects, like the mat. Okay? All right, thank you. So we have more classes coming up, and we will be doing another couple tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be um, more for the brown belt and some black belt material, and then uh, a couple more fitness classes, and on and on. All right, you guys, stay safe, stay strong. See you in a bit. Okay.